that the people in the card room can either come out here if they want to see what's happening, and you're hoping that they can actually see the videos or actually see So, I think you've all charged your glasses, right? The next chance you have to do that will be after the program, which will be about 8 40, and they'll bring new plates of food to share at 8 40 as well. But in the meantime, please consume all these. Um, a couple of other housekeeping points. Um, the COVID 19 protocols, I think most of you filled in the form in advance, and some of you have filled in the form just now. We are supposed to wear our masks when not eating or drinking. I'm talking rather than eating or drinking. But I consulted my neighbours and they said if I wasn't too close to people, they thought it was okay when I was talking. Um, so the evenings consist of two types of intervention. One is live presentations and one is video presentations. So we need to be like in a, a tennis match turning our heads from right to left appropriately. And Felix is the chap who is managing everything. So thank you, thank you very much, Felix. That's going to relax and let him do everything. Um, so Felix is making a video and he's also making photographs. Um, if anybody doesn't want to be in the video, or doesn't want to have their photograph taken, please say so now. If you don't say so now, we assume you're okay for your photograph, for your image, to be on the video, Facebook, everywhere in the world, you're happy. Okay. And Felix is the person who will be editing it. So he's an important man. Right. So now we come to Philip to Werner. So Werner has sent a message. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to this, the 25th Proverse Twice Yearly event, the 24th held at the Helena May. I'm sorry not to be with you in the flesh, but I am with you in spirit and in this pre-recorded video. Enjoy the evening. I will be back later to introduce the launching books and announce the winners of the Proverse Prize 2019. Stay tuned. So now I have great pleasure in introducing Mr. Jeff Dankyville, Consul General of Canada in Hong Kong and Macau. Mr. Jeff Dankyville became Consul General of Canada in Hong Kong and Macau in, in August 2016. And we've had great pleasure in meeting him at several events during the past four years. From 2011 to 2016, Jeff served as Director General responsible for Canada's official development assistance in Asia, first for the Canadian International Development Agency and then with Global Affairs Canada. Jeff has been posted three times to the Canadian Embassy in Beijing in the Development Assistance Section, 1991-95, and 2000-2004, and as Deputy Head of Mission, Deputy Ambassador, 2008-2011. He's fluent in Mandarin. He's held various positions at the Canadian International Development Agency between 1988 and 2008, working on programs related to China, Russia, strategic policy, and international financial institutions. Jeff holds an MSc in political science from that hotbed, London School of Economics, BA in international relations from the University of Toronto, and a certificate, one year program, in Chinese language and culture from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Thank you, well, thank you very much, uh, Jillian, and hello, hello everybody in the other room. <laughs> uh, 
Bonsoir tout le monde. Uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor to, to be with you and to be part of, of the 25th uh, Proverbs uh, ceremony. Uh, I'm, I'm really thrilled uh, to be here as, uh, as a resident of Hong Kong and, and as a representative of, of Canada. Um, I first let me let me give a warm and really deep congratulations uh, to Dr. Jillian Bickley, to Werner Bickley, uh, to Provers for the work that you do to bring authors uh, to the world, um, and doing it here in Hong Kong. It's a, it's a wonderful thing, and uh, and we're I think we're all in your debt for for doing that. Um, uh, as a Canadian representative, I'm particularly proud that we have uh, two authors whose new works will be launched tonight. I think one is in the other room. We didn't, didn't get a chance to meet yet. But John Ng, um, who's here tonight with his first published collection of poetry, Hong Kong Growing Pains, uh, described as a love letter to Hong Kong. Uh, Mr. Ng had the good sense to be born and raised in, the, in Canada's greater Toronto area. That's my dad's choice. Sorry? That's my dad's choice. That's your dad's choice. Then, then you had even further good sense to, to come to this wonderful city. And uh, it's obviously inspired you quite a bit. And uh, something else we have in common apart from Toronto is uh, one of your new poems, uh, Taiku Promenade, uh, is uh, something that touches our own staff because one of our two offices in Hong Kong is in Quarry Bay. Um, and they, they know that promenade, uh, they know that area. Uh, we have a second Canadian author um, a, who is uh, not a, a stranger to Proverse, uh, Gerald Louis Bressin, uh, who's already had the distinction of having his first novel, The Day They Came, published by Proverse uh, eight years ago. And although he cannot join tonight, I'm looking forward to his, uh, his uh, pre recorded uh, remarks about his new novel, No Boundaries for Lucifer. And I have been told, uh, having not seen that video myself, I've been told by someone who did see it that it will be interesting to watch. I, I, I'm not sure what that will bring us. Anyway, it's, uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here with all of you. It's a pleasure to be anywhere with, uh, with, with people um, and with people who love literature and, uh, and who love uh, Hong Kong. Um, I think we are in good company. So thank you very much, uh, Jillian, for including me, and thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you so much. Hello and welcome to the Proverse Autumn Reception. My name is Peter Sudorko and I'm the University Librarian at the University of Hong Kong. This is the second Proverse Reception for 2020 and I commend Gillian and Werner for pursuing this 
uh, given that uh, 2020 has been quite an extraordinary year. It's been difficult at all levels of society, education and, and beyond. Uh, and publications and publishing have not been immune to these adversities. So I, I take this opportunity to, to commend Gillian and Verna, not just for holding the receptions, but for continuing to ensure that quality publications surface in Hong Kong. Uh, again, and with this short note, I want to just say congratulations to Gillian and Verna and to all the authors whose books are being exposed at this rece reception today. Uh, there's quite an extraordinary batch, and I know that Proverse will continue to go from strength to strength, despite difficulties that we may see in society today. Thanks so much. Can I ask a question? Yes. How do, how do you relate to Internet Archive? Internet Archive? Well, the Internet Archive is... is um, we, we utilize the Internet Archive and we contribute to it. In, in short sense, yes. But how do you use it? Is that bigger than the, 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 the setup you're talking about? Absolutely or bigger. Well, and it's different. It's different because World Cap is quality records of bibliographic items like this. The Internet Archive is all and sundry. But it is important. It is important. It is important. The International Provost Prizes are special in that they are open to everyone at least 18 years old at the time of submitting their entry, irrespective of nationality, residence or citizenship. New, emerging and established writers are all welcome to enter. The Provost Prize for a book-length work of fiction, non-fiction or poetry was announced in 2008 and is in its 12th year of competition. We are grateful for support this year, that is 2019 to 2020, for the Provost Prize, book-length works from Hong Kong Arts Development Council. This is the fifth year that the Provost Poetry Prize for single poems has been offered. The International Provost Poetry Prize is for poems of any genre or style, generally no more than 30 lines long. The topic may be chosen by entrance or they may choose the subject set by the administrators. In the past few years, the topics have been, uh, in turn, the environment, happiness, refuge, plastic, and hunger. In 2021, the topic will be shielding, interpreted in any way each entrant likes. The third prize winners, four of them, each of the place in the anthology, are Jack Meyer, USA, Meyer Mitova, Bulgaria, Heine Solomon, New Zealand, and George Watt, Australia. The second prize winner for the place in the anthology is Carol Flake, Carol Flake Chapman, USA. The first prize winner for the place in the anthology is Anne Casey of Australia, formerly of Ireland. This year, in view of the high standard of entries, for the second time, the judges recommend the additional category, special mention. This was for entrants who had at least one entry judged excellent by the panel. Special mention, K.B. Chan, Hong Kong, Natalie Nera, Czech Republic, Linda McKinney-Lambert, 
USA. The names of all those who won a place in the Provis Poetry Prize Anthology 2020 will be listed on the Provis website, provispublishing.com and or the Provis Facebook page, Provis Press and or Twitter feed at Provis Books in a couple of days' time. We are delighted that some of them are here tonight. Poets, when I call your name in alphabetical order, please stand if you're not standing already and raise and wave your hand vigorously so people can see you. Liam Blackford Paula Caroni Sadie Kay Jun Pan Janice Louisa Terno Congratulations to all. We look forward to seeing you again with many others, including from overseas perhaps, on the 22nd of April next year, when the Provost Poetry Prize Anthology 2020 will be launched. So now I'm going to announce the, what am I going to announce? The semi-finalists for the Progress Prize as Brooklyn Work 2020. As always, competition was keen and talent, talent race have been selected as semi-finalists. Five of the semi-finalists live in Hong Kong, that's a bit unusual, and four of them are happily, I hope happily, present tonight. Would you please come out when your name is called to receive a book as a token of your achievement from one of our many distinguished guests? So this is your cue to you. Liam, would you come out?
of the Supplementary Prize winning books in the 2019 Provost Prize competition being launched tonight. John. should be published but are not deemed by the publishers to be commercially viable without a subsidy. The second is to provide grants to authors to allow them to complete such books. Initial funding of Hong Kong dollars 350,000 is provided by the Royal Asiatic Society Hong Kong further £30,000 sterling, then equivalent to another £350,000, was contributed by Lady Clegg, widow of Douglas Clegg, ex Taipan of Hutchison Wong Poe. Sir Lindsay Ride was the post-war Vice-Chancellor of the University of Hong Kong. Ride and Clegg both served in the British Army Aid Group, which assisted Allied efforts in South China during World War II. Royd was the president of the Royal Asiatic Society Hong Kong after it was resuscitated in 1959, hence the name of the fund. The trustee provides for the RAS Hong Kong members to elect two additional trustees at its annual general meeting in 2008. Both I and John Bush, who is a senior solicitor in Wilkinson and Brist and widely respected in the community, were elected as trustees and have served ever since. We have subsequently co-opted Elizabeth Sim, one of the founder trustees, and herself a successful author Hong Kong History Books as a trustee of the Ride Fund. From the outset, the Ride Fund worked closely with the University of Hong Kong Press, which led by its publisher, Colin Day, contributed most of the books, requiring subsidies to be published. After Colin Day in two th retired in 2009, Hong Kong U Press, press Progressively lost interest in working with the Wright family. As a consequence, we were obliged to look further afield for candidates for the RAS Hong Kong Studies series, the name given to the series of books whose publications were subsidised by the Wright family. We presently have relationships with City University Press, joint publishing. Providence Hong Kong and Blacksmith Books. We are rebuilding the relationship with Hong Kong U Press under its new publisher. So far, the yeah, RAS study series comprises 31 books, which average out at some two per year. The rate which in the past could be sustained by the investment return on our funds. Sadly, today this investment return has essentially disappeared. Who knows when it may return? I've only been allocated three minutes, so I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank Thank 
Good evening again, everyone. I'm going to introduce the books being launched tonight and give you results of the Proverse Prize 2019 competition. Three entries for the 2019 Proverse Prize have been awarded as winners of supplementary publication prizes. One, Nick Binge, had his sci-fi novel Professor Everywhere launched at the online April reception before returning to the UK to teach there. Two more finalists are being launched tonight. John Assom is the author of Cooler Ships of the Chinese Diaspora, 1846 to 1874. John was born in Hong Kong and attended St. Joseph's College just up the road. He is represented tonight by his sister, Pat Yun. An expert in the subject, Walton Luke Lai, has written this of John Assam's book. Coolie ships of the Chinese diaspora fills an enormous gap in our knowledge of the Chinese coolie trade. John Assam has enabled readers and future scholars to distinguish fact from myth, reality from exaggeration in the understanding of this vast and complex experience. All will be inspired by this brave project, all the more so because it is the result of one man's single-minded devotion over the years, rather than the work of a collective body. Jan Pearson is an Australian who lived in Hong Kong in her girlhood. Tonight we launch Blue Dragon Spring, the fourth in her series of thrillers set in Hong Kong. William Wadsworth in the Sunday Morning Post described an earlier book in the series, Tiger Autumn, as one of the best Hong Kong novels in years. As for Blue Dragon Spring, Joe Darlington in the Manchester Review of Books calls it a hell of a page-turner. This year we award two prizes to writers as winners of the International Proverse Prize 2019. Each receives the prize of publication and they share the cash prize. They are Jack Meyer of Vermont, USA, with his first poetry collection, but by no means his first book, Poems from the Wilderness, and a J.P. Lindstroth of Palm Springs, Florida, with his second work of poetry, Epochal Reckonings. It is the first time that two poetry collections have shared the Proverse Prize. J.P. Lindstroth's Epochal Reckonings approaches large topics. He observes the impact on individuals and on society of several recent catastrophic events. In his poems from the wilderness, Jack Meyer has a more eschatological focus on the spiritual thoughts inspired by mountain trekking and by his work as a medical doctor. We will hear from them both by video later. Congratulations to all these winners. The three other books being launched this evening are published as part of the regular Proverse publishing program and did not come to us as an entry for the Proverse Prize. Gerard Bryson's narrative, No Boundaries for Lucifer, is a Vietnam War prisoner escape narrative. It has stories within stories, tales of military experience and descriptions of diabolical interference in the human world. John Ng describes Hong Kong growing pains 
his first poetry collection as an exploration of the city of Hong Kong, as well as the translation of emotions felt during the tumultuous second half of 2019. Julian Bickley is my wife. She writes both detailed books on historical topics and short poems. Grandfather's Robin is her sixth poetry collection. Congratulations to these writers on the publication of these new works. Hello folks, I'm Jack Mayer. I live in the United States in the cold and snowy New England state of Vermont. I'm honored and delighted that my poetry collection, Poems from the Wilderness, has been chosen as one of two winners of the Proverse Prize 2019. These poems are inspired by the mystery and beauty I have experienced walking alone in wilderness, where most of them were composed. They are deeply personal, but I hope they will resonate with those pieces of wilderness we all carry within us. Solitude and the natural world are the fertile medium in which my thoughts and words marinate, a stew flavored by revelations about physics, spirit, and music, as well as by the insights I receive from the forests and trails I walk. I draw inspiration from Walt Whitman, Emerson, Gary Snyder, and Mary Oliver, among others. I want to thank the founders of the Proverse Prize, Gillian and Werner Bickley, for creating this opportunity for writers wherever they live, whatever their citizenship or nationality, to share their work. We live in a time when the earth is threatened and urban humans have lost their essential connection with the natural world. This collection is my effort to encourage wider appreciation of our Earth's boundless wonders and to advocate greater stewardship of our home planet. Thank you. Hello everyone, this is J.P. Lindstraw in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, United States. It is one, it's one of the great honors of my life to accept as one of two winners the 2019 Proverse Prize from my book of poetry, Epical Reckonings. I'm especially and profoundly grateful for the founders and publishers of Proverse Publishers Hong Kong, Dr. Jillian Bickley and Dr. Werner Bickley. Additionally, I am very appreciative for the work of the Proverse editorial team for realizing my book in its existing form. I cannot imagine a better experience with an editorial team Moreover, I am likewise most thankful to my family and friends without whose support this book would never have come to fruition. Likewise, it is indeed unfortunate not to be able to accept this esteemed and wonderful prize in person in Hong Kong. Yet all of us throughout the world are having to adjust to a new normal because of the coronavirus, COVID-19. Regrettably, international travel is, for many, including myself, limited. So while I come to you via recorded video today, please know I wish I could be there without, with all of you in person in Hong Kong and celebrating this personal milestone, milestone with you. Let me, if I may, say something brief about my poetry book, Ethical Record and why I think it was awarded this valued Proverse Prize. My book was envisioned as a witness account of the great tragedies in these early years of the 21st century, namely the great migration crisis across the globe, September 11, 2001, Hurricane Katrina 2005, the Haitian earthquake in 2010, the tortures of Abu Ghraib prison in 2003, the last three US presidential administrations, Bush, Obama, and Trump, 
mass starvation in Yemen because of civil war, school shootings in the United States, homelessness, and the recent murders of young African men and women in the U.S. Brazilian Amerindian genocide, and in general, racism against minorities. Hence, this is, a, this is the ambitious canvas in which I chose to work in order to present the reader with a witness account of our present times. Ironically, my prize-winning book was written prior to this global pandemic of the coronavirus, COVID-19, and prior to the wildfires in California and the Western United States, among many other countless global tragedies. As such, Epical Reckonings is an incomplete portrayal of our times. Because of this, the book is meant to be emergent and partial, as well as inchoate. Like the Italian Renaissance artist Michelangelo's sculptures known as prigione, prisoners, or schiave, slaves, the words presented in the book are symbolically fettered to our epoch and provide a sort of semiotic accounting of our contemporary age, not within white marble, unlike Michelangelo's sculptures, but within the limited scope of white pages, and as such, a limited encapsulation of our contemporaneous era. In the past, there have been controversies about whether or not art should be allowed to depict great human tragedies, such as the Holocaust when the fascist Nazi regime of the Third Reich under Adolf Hitler in Germany tried to exterminate the European Jewish people. And yet today, we realize that in order to preserve great tragedies such as the Shoah, Hebrew for Holocaust, we also need art as witness. For the purposes of remembrance regarding such unspeakable human calamities, thus I believe the novel Night by Eli Weissel and Primo Levi's novel, If This Is a Man, both authors, survivors of the Holocaust, prove why art as witness is so essential for recounting human misfortunes among innumerable other examples of art. Perhaps Pablo Picasso's evocative mural-like cubist black and white painting of Guernica also comes to mind. Here, Picasso, was depicting the disastrous bombing of a small Basque town in Spain during the Civil War by the Nazi Germany Luftwaffe, killing mostly women, children, and the elderly. The painting would come to represent all of the uh, horrors of the Spanish Civil War and all the terrors of the Franco dictatorship between 1939 and 1975. So while I can only hope to emulate such profound works of art, I must, in all humility, explain that my poetry book, Epical Reckonings, is my own meager attempt to encompass and summarize disaster ha disastrous happenings in the present day. After all, human-made and na natural disasters depicted in my book are much greater than any one person and are, of course, much more overwhelming and powerful than myself as an artist and writer. Therefore, to depict such great sufferings and tribulations with the justice they deserve is something that a poet such as myself can only hope and aspire for. In sum, the poems presented in my book are purposely meant to cause concern, discussion, and surprise as well as to evoke emotions of anger, empathy, and sadness. And above all, the poems in my book are meant to give voice to the sometimes voiceless and to provide an accounting, however limited, for our present age. Finally, I wish to thank Proverse Hong Kong for believing in my work and in me as an artist and writer. I also wish to thank you, future readers, perhaps for picking up my book, as I hope you will, and finding your own meaning for our day and age. Possibly also reflecting upon my musings on the present zeitgeist 
as an exemplar of our experience in the here and now. I wish you all health and safety today and in the future. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm John Osoma speaking from Melbourne, Australia. I was born in Hong Kong, BCC and know the area around the Helena May well. I went to school at St. Joseph's College across the peak tram tracks and went to Master at St. Joseph's Church just next door. I would have been one of the first members of the American Library across the road. When I looked over to the Helena May from my classroom window, I used to think that is where the spinsters lived. Firstly, I would like to thank Werner and Gillian Bickley for giving me the opportunity to bring my book to fruition. Gillian's patience and persistence has converted a mediocre manuscript into a fine book. Thank you, Gillian. 65 years ago, almost to the day, I spotted Mary Kwan on the jetty watching my ship come alongside in Kaviang. She spoke perfect English and it intrigued me to find a Chinese girl in such a remote place. But then as I traveled the world, I seemed to find Chinese descendants everywhere. Have you ever felt claustrophobic cooped up in a jumbo jet? The two economy cabins together measure roughly seven meters wide by 40 meters long. That was about the average space on a typical coolie ship. Where there could have been 350 of you whiling away 12 hours of your life, some 400 coolies would have been enduring anything from 69 to 320 days in a similar space. When they couldn't go up on deck, the toilet buckets regularly overflowed into the sleeping space. That was the journey for over 291,000 Chinese men, women and children that embarked on 732 ships for places sometimes unknown. Only about 247,000 of them made it to their destinations. 31 ships did not complete their voyages from stress of weather, abandonment or mutiny. Early mutinies were brought about because of the cruelty of captains. They routinely treated their crews with contempt and floggings were commonplace. It would not have crossed their minds that their coolie passengers should be treated any differently. However, cutting off their pigtails on the grounds of cleanliness may have been too extreme. At least two captains lost their lives because of this act. Mary Kwan lived in New Ireland, which was the scene for one of the stories in my book. How seafarers treated each other in the 1800s is described in the account of the Grimaniza. Then there's the story about the heroism of a 65-year-old Dutch pilot who risked his life trying to save lives from the shipwrecked Italia off Anja. When he fell off the ship totally exhausted, his faithful dog saved him. You'll no doubt be saddened by the testimony of Leung Asiu. When his ship, the Don Yuan, was set on fire by his fellow passengers, he was saved only because he still had a few dollars on him. Others, floundering about in the water, were ignored by the passing fishing junks. They could not pay to be saved. Such is man's inhumanity to man. Poetry books end with an envoy. My book is not of poems, but it has an envoy. Check it out. If you find my book interesting, mention it to a friend. Thank you and take care. Good evening. My name is Gerard Bresson and I am born in the city of Aix-en-Provence, southeast of France, close to Marseille. I've been in China for the past 15 years, teaching hospitality and tourism management at Jilin University London College. I wrote this novel, No Boundaries for Lucifer, because I believe in the devil. The devil is always lurking around for new prey. People who are not religious, people who do not believe in God, people who are always in trouble, whatever, and that is the story. I have an affinity with uh, the army and 
the escape in the Vietnam War from the colonel and his team is going to narrate a lot of situations happening but he meets the devil so I'm going to read for you some parts of the story that you're going to encounter the story is narrated by a retired five-star general who was a US Special Forces colonel during the Vietnam War the reader witnesses a harrowing escape from a Viet Cong prisoner camp and from then on will follow the US team through villages, ambushes, mortar attacks, river swims until they are rescued by the US cavalry helicopters. The escapees encounter sympathetic people who want to help them but they also face the relentless VC, meaning the Viet Cong, the National Vietnamese Army and the psychopath Colonel Han from the North Vietnamese Secret Bureau. Above all, they are the devil's prey. Lucifer wants them to fail and will butt heads with the Colonel. We all know the evil exists but how often have we met him in person? The colonel does, and more than once. The colonel's faith in God prevails, and his strong leadership abilities will help him get his team out of many dire threats. The group of experienced soldiers literally grow through hell together before they are saved. Unfortunately, members of the team die. But it does not prevent the colonel from pursuing his mission. On his way, he rests at the mission, a French Catholic monastery nestling in the hills of North Vietnam. Sister Marie Catherine, the mother superior, still becomes a good friend and a motivator to the colonel and gives him confidence to succeed in his perilous mission. He also meets the council, a group of Jesuit priests and nuns who have all faced Satan in person at some point. Demonic possession and exorcism will leave you perplexed, pondering about Lucifer's diabolic powers. However, through it all, God's excellence and goodness will win over Lucifer's stratagems. Many remarkable people appear in the story. Some are natural gifted, others work with the power of God. You will meet Jesus, the Virgin Mary, and Madame Labelle, a guardian angel for a nurse who is pursuing medical studies in the world's best hospitals. You will see the Garden of Eden and descend into the heart of hell with a contract killer. In one of the chapters, an unforgettable and idyllic moment then takes place in a majestic French cathedral. God comes down to talk to his son Jesus and gives him advice. Sister Ivan witnesses the occurrence and will be marked forever by the beauty of it. Meanwhile, the team swims between two large rivers, which are infested with putrid detritus, dead bodies, filth, and above all, large alligators and poisonous water snakes. They encounter the pirates, cruel, and ruthless sailors roaming wild around the Vietnamese river, kings of trafficking. However, our soldiers make it to safety with the help of the Navy SEALs, the elite commandos of the US Navy. God was there for them all along. This novel is entertaining and exhilarating. You will not be able to put it down. 
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, it is a pleasure to participate in this year's reception to celebrate the outcome of the Proverse Literary Competition. And I am pleased to have had my latest book recognised with a supplementary prize awarded by the judges for a work of fiction, the title of which is Blue Dragon Spring. Blue Dragon Spring is the final novel in the Celestial Symbol series, a quartet of crime and mystery novels set in Hong Kong between 1964 and 1980, and which can be read as standalone novels or sequentially. While each book has a strong association with classic crime writing, featuring strong and rather complex plots, William Wadsworth in the Sunday Morning Post observed on, of the second novel, Tiger Autumn, that my writing style is entertaining as well as meeting the requirements of genre. Much appreciated compliment. And in addition, I am sensitive to the fact that the social fabric reflected in each book should reflect the Hong Kong of its time as authentically as possible. This involves endless poring over Hal Ebsen's wonderful book called Mapping Hong Kong in a valiant attempt to reflect the street layouts and streetscapes of 1964, 1975, 1979 and 1980, the years in which Tiger Autumn, Redbird Summer, Black Tortoise Winter and Blue Dragon Spring are set. In launching this novel, Blue Dragon Spring, I know I will find it difficult to leave behind characters who have lived in my head as well as on the page during the past decade, and I have well and truly come to understand why so many writers stay with the same series during the entirety of their writing careers. I have watched the chief protagonist, Pearl Green, mature from a flighty, headstrong teenager into a fine woman, albeit one forever doomed to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and consequently always in trouble. Nothing changes for Pearl in Blue Dragon Spring, in which Hong Kong enters 1980 in a very restless mood, which matches Pearl's state of mind. China's doors have opened to foreign investments, Hong Kong's manufacturing base is in decline, and the number of illegal immigrants continues to grow. Meanwhile, many Hong Kong residents depart, their confidence in the future already affected by speculation about the handover to China following the expiry of Britain's lease many years down the track. In January 1980, Tony Smith, who is the illegitimate son of Hong Kong's most powerful gangster and nephew of tycoon Yip Yi Koon, abandons his role as leader of the Wo Luan Xing Triad, which is based in the wall city of Kowloon, and returns to England where he was educated. His departure unleashes family secrets which almost decimate the, the Yip Empire, while other criminal groups in the infamous city use his exes to seize power. Yes, I realise I have used the T word. For the duration of my three previous novels, there has been some references and a little direct action involving triads. It's difficult to write about crime and Hong Kong and ignore their existence after all. And I have previously given the relevant action a bit of a twist in the tail. Blue Dragon Spring is no exception and I can assure you that even though my favourite tycoon's nephew forsakes his inherited leadership of the city's most powerful gang, which is followed by chaos, naturally, the action has a certain slapstick choreography, made possible by the wonderful Hua Leung, chauffeur to the inimitable Yip Yi Kun. A month or two after Smith quits, we find Pearl Green in attendance at a conference in England in her role of director of the Hong Kong-based June Bowen Foundation. She witnesses a worrying incident in Soho, which causes her London-based father, James Gates, to make an unexpected trip to Hong Kong after he links this and another recent incident to a Hong Kong source. During the flight, James encounters a beautiful Eurasian woman wearing Tony Smith's distinctive dragon sapphire ring, a ring worn only by the leader of the Wo Luan Sheng. It can only mean Smith is dead. James is appalled at the woman's overt display of power and assigns his men on the ground in Hong Kong, Peter Benson, occasional home office operative, and Yip Yi Kun's flappable chauffeur Hua Leung, to follow the woman with the blue dragon ring and discover what she plans on contributing 
to the palpable restlessness abroad in Hong Kong in the opening months of the new decade. It is exciting to complete a book and follow it to publication. And tonight I have an additional cause to welcome Blue Dragon Spring into the world. A pre-launch review by Joe Darlington in Manchester Review of Books declares that this final novel in the series, and I quote, paints a picture of a bygone era, but one not so bygone, still in fact alive in many residents' memories. Its freedoms, after all, were, in the main, still enjoyed until only a few months ago. Their disappearance coincided with our own lockdown, but it will take more than a vaccine to restore them. As the novel ends by saying, all seems well enough in Hong Kong, but for how long? This places the novel in a curious position, both current and nostalgic, hard-boiled and cynical, and yet still glamorous and dazzling. It is a fitting finale to the four directions and a hell of a page turner, end of quote. Most of us who write do so for the love of us, never consciously looking for recognition as we develop frown lines from doing battle with the written word. It is a joy to receive commendation for one's work, and I'm extremely grateful also to Gillian and Verna Bickley for the constant, consistent report, support they have given me during this most exciting phase of my writing career. I hope you enjoy blue, reading Blue Dragon Spring. Thank you all and good night. Thank you very much to all the writers. And now we have a night writer, John Eng, who will introduce his book. Same thing as the video, so you're not missing anything. Alright. Um, I think of Hong Kong growing pains as many things. It is a book of transition and struggle, a volume of work that launches off from a childhood steeped in insecurity before it docks in the world of uncertain adults. It is a witness report, recording the struggles of students and that of an entire city as Hong Kong and the youth in it alike have struggled with changes that seem so beyond their control. It is reflective, yet distortive. A magnifying glass that tries to focus on the infinitesimal while recognizing that every piece is a part of the larger puzzle. It is a lens to see truth through, while being a visor made up of lies, as anything written by the writer is really more reflective of their own truth than a universal one. It is, in other words, a book. A book with a sealed past, and a fertile future filled with interpretations of all sorts, including those of the miss and re varieties. It's also a work of hope and despair and gratitude. It's a book that wouldn't be possible without the people who supported me when I needed the support. It has fed on the kindness of friends who were willing to shelter me when I had no home, aid me when I could offer them nothing in return. A book made possible by the love and advice of people far smarter yet somehow quieter than I am. So I thank them here, uh, my wife, Pover's Publishing. Um, the Nandas, Michael Leal, Issa Chua, all of my teachers, mentors, and my lifelong companions, Benjamin Lau, Arthur Trung, Rolf Pillay, and others that I simply don't have the time to thank for uh, supporting me up to this point, and I hope to, books, to more books in the future. Finally, there's one more thing that this book is. It's incomplete. It was originally a symmetrical collection of uh, 36 poems sliced into three sections, 12 poems in each. And now you'll see that in the last section there are only 10. Uh, and this was voluntary. Inevitably I was won over by the advice of those that I love and those that I respect. Uh, those with more experience than I, and so I admitted two poems. It hurt, but it was necessary. And so the work is not complete, yet the void that those poems leave speaks to the empty space, saying something, nevertheless. In the end, Hong Kong Growing Pains is a book about Hong Kong, the city that has shaped me, a place where the streets are so packed with people that seeing everybody as individual souls is exhausting, so we glaze our eyes over and pretend otherwise. It is a book about a place where we struggle openly on the streets and under the bright spotlights of prosperity and yet weep in the safety and shadows of our own homes. 
It is about a place so rich and varied that I can't pretend that this book will offer you anything more than a nibble of its real character. Nevertheless, this is my taste. And whether or not it is to yours, I hope it goes down well, and that readers, all readers can enjoy it in their own way. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I think of Hong Kong Growing Pains as many things. It is a book of transition and struggle, a volume of work that launches off from a childhood steeped in insecurity before it docks in the world of uncertain adults. It is a witness report, recording the struggles and of students and of an entire city, as Hong Kong and the youth in it alike have struggled with changes that seem so beyond their control. It is reflective yet distortive, a magnifying glass that tries to focus on the infinitesimal while recognizing that every piece is a part of the larger puzzle. It is a lens to see truth through, while being a visor made up of lies as anything written by a writer is more reflective of their own truth than it is of a universal one. It is, in other words, a book. A book with a sealed past and a fertile future filled with interpretations of all sorts, including those of the Miss and the Re varieties. It's also a work of hope, despair, and gratitude. It's a book that wouldn't be possible without the people who supported me when I needed the support. It has fed on the kindness of friends who were willing to shelter me when I had no home, aid me when I could not offer them nothing in return. A book made possible by the love and advice of, those, of people far smarter yet somehow quieter than I am. So I thank them here. My wife, Proverse Publishing, the Nandas, Michael Yaw, Ace Le Chua, all of my teachers, mentors, and my lifelong companions, Benjamin Lau, Arthur Chung, Rahul Pillay, and others that I simply don't have the time to thank for supporting me up to this point, and I hope to more books in the future. Finally, there's one more thing that this book is. It's incomplete. It was originally a symmetrical collection of 36 poems sliced into three sections, 12 poems in each. And now you'll see that in the last section, there are only 10. This was voluntary. I, inevitably, I was won over by the advice of those that I love and those that I respect, those with more experience than I, and so I omitted two poems. It hurt, but it was necessary. And so the work is not complete, yet the void that those poems leave speaks to. The empty space says something nevertheless. In the end, Hong Kong Growing Pains is a book of poems about Hong Kong, the city that has shaped me. A place where the streets are so packed with people that seeing everybody as individual souls is exhausting. So we glaze our eyes over and pretend otherwise. It is a book about a place where we struggle openly on the streets and under the bright spotlights of prosperity, and yet weep in the safety and shadows of our own homes. It is a place so rich and varied that I can't pretend that this book will offer you anything more than a nibble of its real character. Nevertheless, this is mine, and whether or not my offering is to your taste, I hope it goes down well, and that all readers can enjoy it in their own way. Thank you. I, I'm the only author who hasn't prepared a talk. But before I give my unprepared talk, could we just give a presentation to Pat or John? Um, James, can I just borrow that? Can I have that, please? Yes, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Pat, would you like to come out and get um, okay. <laughs>
um, so for mine, as I said, I'm the only one who didn't prepare a talk. I was so busy organizing other people that I ran out of time. And so I'm going to read the advanced reviews. Um, so Jack Mayer, who we saw earlier, wrote, so many reasons to, perhaps I can take this off. <laughs> He wrote so many reasons to enjoy Julian Vickie's luminous poetry, humour, depth and wisdom. Lovely and evocative, Bickley's powers of observation and precise, selective description lend many of his poems the power of fine portraiture, a sepia photograph where we see into the eyes, where we discover essence. And Mary Jane Newton, who whose two poetry collections we published, of Symbols Misused and Unlocking, she wrote, in this work, Julian Bickley affords us a glimpse into her perspective. She invites us to reflect on the rich tapestry of life and our shared human experience. Why should you read this collection? Because there is no greater privilege than intimacy. And finally, Stephen Schroeder, whose very nice art I've used on the front cover, is also a poet. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> so he described the book as poems as moments of tranquility in which we can encounter lives unrolling in times that are anything but. To make a record such as this is a good resolution indeed. And I am pleased that Julian has chosen for the cover a moment of tranquility I painted. As Mrs. Dorothy Collins might have said, Dorothy was a senior lecturer in chemistry in Hong Kong U, and I knew her well. And one of the poems is about her funeral. And she had a saying which was always very well. And you never knew whether she, if you asked her to do something, she'd say, very well. And you never knew whether she was happy to do it, or she was not happy to do it, but she would do it. So as Mrs. Dorothy Collins might have said, reflecting, as these poems do, the quietness of a lifelong practice, very well. <laughs> and now I'm going to give a brief tribute to Vernon. Without Verna, none of us would be here. None of us. Now, how is that the case? Um, charm, energy, influence, enthusiasm, extreme conscientiousness, the ability to see what others might like to do, and indirectly, over time, work on them to do it. Verna and I met at an Royal Asiatic Society Hong Kong event, and then and ever afterwards, his love of books has been apparent. It was a natural progression for a wife who likes to do what might please her husband to become a full-time publisher and literary prize organiser after retirement. We know Jeff Nankerville through the Royal Commonwealth Society Hong Kong of which Vernon is a past president and life council member. We know Peter Sidorko because, as founder chairman of the English-speaking Union Hong Kong, Vernon received books from an ESU in Florida every year with a request to donate them appropriately. One year, Peter kindly agreed to be the recipient of the donation on behalf of the University of Hong Kong Library. We know Jeff Streeton because Burma was part of the British Council for many years, serving in Burma, Indonesia, and Japan. And he touched base with Jeff when he arrived in Hong Kong. All others here we know from extensions of these contacts, whether at one, two, or three removes. I hope next year, when the pandemic is contained, Verna can be with us again in the flesh. <laughs> so are there any questions? This is the end of the programme. Does anybody have any questions? Hong Kong style. No questions. <laughs> <laughs> so it remains, it remains to me to 
say thank you very much for coming. We have room until 9.30. Drinks can be ordered again. More food will be served. Please stay to enjoy the joyous company. I don't actually, and I do have some books to sell, yes. If anybody would like to buy a book, there are books on the table. Um, somebody on the table, gather money, uh, as much as we consider appropriate or not. And I think it has to be an honor, an honor system, because I don't have any means of doing it. I'd like to give particular thanks to the Helena May and the Helena May staff. They're always willing, they're always efficient, and this time it's particularly difficult circumstances. I'd also like to give huge thanks to Felix, who's made it not at all stressful for me. <laughs> Undoubtedly it was very stressful for him, but I also think we'd like to thank him very much for what he did. So, once again, thank you very much for joining us, for your support. The spring reception is April 22nd. I hope you're all ready to spend. And enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you very much.